Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a good day to you. I'm Zaid Raad Al Hussein, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, today, with the distinct uh, privilege of interviewing a friend, an inspiration, uh, a teacher, uh, Ben Ferenc, who is known very well to all of the international criminal lawyers who are applying their trade to bring justice to victims. Ben, as many of you know, uh, was the chief prosecutor of the Einsatzgruppen uh, case, uh, and he succeeded in convicting all 22 defendants brought before the Nuremberg Tribunal. He also devoted the uh, early part of his life to supporting the victims of those uh, enormous and colossal atrocities uh, visited upon uh, the Jewish uh, nationals of Europe, but not just them, the Roma and others who had suffered at the hands of the Nazis. And in subsequent years, led a campaign for the creation of an international criminal court. And that's when I had the honor of meeting him uh, many years ago. So Ben, welcome and thank you for agreeing to this uh, interview. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the honor <laughs> of being able to sit next to the High Commissioner for Human Rights. <laughs> thank uh, you, Ben. And uh, to be given such a warm welcome. Thank you, Ben. So can I begin, uh, first of all, by stating the reasons for this interview. Uh, go back to uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, we will be celebrating its 70th anniversary in December, along with the uh, 70th anniversary of the adoption of the Genocide Convention the day before the Universal Declaration was adopted. Uh, I was up in Hyde Park uh, with my children back in the summer, and I visited the uh, uh, FDR home, Franklin D. Roosevelt and Ele Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, home up there. And in the museum, I saw a copy of the Universal Declaration, and it was the Kassan draft. And what struck me, Ben, is the first line. The first line of that draft of the Universal Declaration uh, was, was stark, and it said, ignorance and contempt of human rights have been the principal or among the principal causes of sufferings of humanity. You knew Kassan. The Universal Declara Declaration is often portrayed as an aspirational, idealistic document. But like you, Kassan had experienced war firsthand. What do you remember about him? And, and do you think that this view of the world, that if you reject human rights, you open up the possibility of uh, much wrongdoing, beginning with, with war, which you have spent most of your life, if not all of your life, fighting against. Well, thank you very much for the question. It's quite comprehensive. By coincidence, not coincidence, I always carry with me what I have now in my pocket, the Universal Declaration <laughs> of Human Rights. I have it in my bag, which I'm sitting on, <laughs> together with the United States Constitution uh, and uh, the U.S., the, the United Nations Charter, and those have been my guides. And uh, I recognized immediately that the original draft is not in the final text. Exactly, uh, exactly. But now to answer your questions, René Cassar was a visionary. He had experienced the war. He knew the horrors of war. As a decent human being, he recognized the need for universal principles, because the world war covered many countries, but not the whole universe, and we are all members of one small planet, yeah. and we should deal with the problems in a planetary sense. I wrote a little booklet with that title, Planethood. No longer think in terms of neighborhood or nationhood, but think in terms of we are all right. inhabitants of one planet. So he grasped that. Then, of course, listing all the various rights <laughs> takes a book. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, of course, some of them are a little bit ambiguous in just general principles. But it's a crying out um, for what I now call prohibition of crimes against humanity. It's an appeal of humanity to law. And I use that phrase. Yes. Uh, and I was inspired by people like René Cassa, yes. uh, who were following uh, those guidelines. And uh, they were realists, uh, but they were also 
very aware of the horrors of war, having experienced it as a witness or as a victim. And uh, so they were able to feel deeply about that. And I very much regret that uh, this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, unfortunately, is being violated in more of the principles than it's being accepted. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. The, the text that I quoted was redrafted and became the second paragraph of the preamble. What strikes me, of course, is when you look at the world today, sadly, alas, notwithstanding everything we've tried to achieve that you've devoted your life to, we still see uh, some terrible uh, crimes being committed in northern Rakhine, in Myanmar, what we've seen in Syria, what we've seen in other parts of the world, in Libya and Yemen and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And uh, is this not a, a, a validation of the view that ignorance and contempt of human rights provides then for wrongdoing on a massive scale. And uh, if we can only have a recognition that we as humans, as you said, planet Earth, that we, are, we belong to one team, team human beings, uh, that only if we have this vision can we keep the world safe. But the idea you know, put forward by the President of the United States, but uh, not just him, others, that there is a first, America first, you know, these chauvinistic nationalisms, it sort of in one way betrays the sense that uh, we all have universal rights that ought to be respected by all governments. Well, you have touched upon the crucial problem facing humankind today, and that is the conflict uh, between what you've expressed here as human rights uh, and the glorification of non-human rights, the glorification of war making. Mm. What we are trying to do is to reverse something which has been glorified for centuries, mm. centuries, ever since little David mm. hit Goliath in the head with a rock mm. and became the king thereby. Mm. Uh, if that were all the condition of the world today, I wouldn't object mm. <laughs> hit somebody in the head with a rock. But it's even worse than your characterization mm. because the capacity to kill human beings has grown faster than our capacity to meet their mm urgent and vital and justified needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we stand on the verge of having used nuclear weapons, which are now obsolete, because we're mm -hmm. in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. And from cyberspace, mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. it on very reliable mm -hmm. authority, mm -hmm. secret mm -hmm. message to me by an American general 15 years ago, mm -hmm. so I can talk about it now. We have the capacity to cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Imagine what this planet would look like mm. if somebody in cyberspace turns their head and says, no more Washington, D.C., <coughs> all the lights go out, the hospitals stop working, the water stops flowing, the peop no traffic lights, everything stops. How long would it take? And I asked this general who was confiding this to me yeah. many years ago, how long would it take for everybody to die? Yeah. And he said, well, I'm not aware of any studies to that effect, but I assume that uh, it would depend upon how much water they had. Yeah. If they had water, they could probably live for about a week. Yeah. If they didn't have water, then of course it would be much shorter, of yeah. course. So yeah. <laughs> there it was, an awareness that we have the capacity to kill everybody on this planet. That's right. And become like all the other billions of planets, lifeless in space. That's right. We have the capacity, right. man, to create it. Don't we have the capacity to stop it and That's to right. stop creating it? That's the issue. That's right. That's right. I mean, there's this odd paradox, isn't there, where the more the world relies on technology, the closer we bring ourselves to that very possibility that if used uh, malevolently, we return ourselves to the Stone Age and worse, as you said, to human extinction, essentially. There are other uh, returns to the Stone Age. I recently read the position of the United States, the strategic position of the United States with regard to war and peace. It was signed by the Secretary of Defense, but it spoke, I'm sure, for the country. And there were two major points which struck me in that I only read the 20-page summary. The mm -hmm. process itself is much longer, but I got the point. Main point was make sure we have enough budget to cover the needs of the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. That's point number two. Yeah. And the second one struck me as being most interesting. He said, also, we have to be sure to win the war. Mm -hmm. 
I paused when I read that, and it appeared at least four or five times in the mm. report. I said to myself, win the war? Mm. What do you win? Mm. Who wins mm. a war? Mm. Does it mean you kill everybody else? Mm. You kill millions mm. of people and you say we won, mm. including millions of our own, mm. and we say we won mm. the war? Mm. The whole concept, and this mm. is the Secretary of Defense. I'm sure he's a very fine mm. gentleman. He mm. served in the Marines mm. all of his life. Mm. He was trained to think mm. we have to put in the budget and win the war. Mm. Um, and he's a noble hero. He is the Secretary of Defense, mm. our highest ranking officer. Mm. And he speaks certainly for at least mm. half the people in the country. Mm. So how do we turn that around? Mm. You say you cannot win a war. Mm. Everybody loses in a war. The only winner in war is death. That's right. And I have seen it That's in action. Right. And uh, they have seen it in action. Mm. Don't they see the connection? Mm. And it's getting worse and more dangerous mm. all the time. Mm. That's why now, as I'm approaching very soon my 100th year, yeah, uh, I'm still trying to stop that yes. and reverse that because it'll take a long time. But you now have gone to the heart of the issue that intelligent people, intelligent human beings can rationalize actions and policies which would seem to be, which would seem to be uh, appalling in their consequences and yet it sort of fits a certain logic. I'm always reminded, and I, whenever, whenever I watch Charlie Chaplin's uh, speech in The Great Dictator at the end, and he says, the world doesn't need more clever people. It needs kind people. It needs people who care, who are empathetic. When you were prosecuting the, uh, the 22 defendants, and perhaps you tell us why it was only 22 when there were 3,000 killers who um, who ravaged Eastern Europe, and uh, why did you select those 22? But among them were some highly educated individuals. Uh, uh, Otto Rush had uh, two doctorates in law and economics. Uh, Otto Ollendorf uh, had two degrees as well. Um, and Paul Blobel had, uh, had uh, 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 at least he practiced architecture, so he was a, uh, a seemingly refined individual. And, and yet they were capable of the most uh, heinous barbar you know, barbarity. And Blobel, of course, Babi Yar, and, and um, the uh, killing of children, the 90 children, and um, I think it was called the Tsirka, the, the um, uh, I might have to remind myself here, uh, the Bill at Tsirka uh, massacre. So how do we reconcile the fact that these are intelligent human beings that are capable of committing such outrage? You have combined several difficult questions in your presentation. The first one that struck me is uh, how do you rationalize war making? And uh, I've given you the quotation from the highest officer in the United States. It's something which we have glorified for centuries America is a great democracy. It's inevitable that there will be differences of opinion, and it's as it should be. And all of the opinions are entitled to respect. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to follow them, or you have to agree with them if you think mm -hmm. they're wrong. And that's the condition we have in the world today, with the United States being a principal leader uh, in the thinking and acting on these principles. It's not that the people who glorify war are evil people or stupid people. Mm. They are not. They are patriotic people carrying on a, what they conceive to be a great tradition and giving us the power that we have now to control the world uh, and deal with it as we see fit. Uh, and those who are not fit to be cared for, well, just push them aside. Mm. Uh, that's a mentality which has existed in many countries. It mm. existed in Nazi Germany, yes. of course, yes. where inferior peoples were to be exterminated, yeah. useless eaters, yeah. they called them, uh, habitual criminals and so on. Uh, so we have a basic philosophical problem. And uh, how do you deal with that? It's deeply felt. You cannot end it by saying, I think you're wrong. They say, well, I think you're wrong. You are a dreamer. You're an idealist. You want to, you're reaching for the moon. 
To which my reply is, haven't you heard? We landed on the moon. <laughs> 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 and uh, and as, as, as distant as it may seem, uh, I think it's possible, and I don't agree with those who take, let's call it the conservative view. I don't share that because I see the impact of it on the people, and the impact is enormous. You're killing millions of innocent people who never did anybody any harm. The current system, current system, is if you don't agree, the heads of state don't agree, the president or whoever it is doesn't agree with another one, what do they do? They send young people over to kill the other young people mm -hmm. whom they don't even know, who may have done them no harm, who may have never harmed anybody, who will live in a country you may never have heard of, mm -hmm. and they kill each other until they get tired of killing each other. Then they pause, each side declares victory, then they start again, and mm -hmm. they continue killing each other. Mm -hmm. And they spend all their money on improved weapons to kill more people, mm -hmm. instead of using it to meet the legitimate concerns mm -hmm. of the people who are so distressed by their living conditions that they cry out in, in, in panic and in mm. fear, help, mm. help us, and will commit all kinds of acts which we call terrorism mm. in an effort to improve their own condition. Mm. So instead of using the funds to help them eliminate their justified complaints, mm. we use it to create more weapons mm. to kill more people. That is crazy, mm. in my opinion. Mm. I may be a nut, mm. but that is totally yeah. criminally yeah. insane. Yeah. And that is the policy followed today, mm. not only by the United States, mm. but many of its allies mm. and other countries. Mm. So that's the world in which we live. And you ask the question, all right, Benny boy, how do we change that? Mm. If you want a one-word answer, it's slowly. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that's really a cop-out <laughs> because there is no quick answer to it. Mm. And I am an optimist. Mm. People ask me, are you a pessimist mm. or an optimist? Mm. I say I am a realist. Mm. Uh, as a pessimist, I see all these legitimate complaints. Mm. And they are legitimate. It's crazy what we do, mm. as I've just simpli mm. simplified but explained it. It's totally mm. insane mm. what we do. It's murderous, mm. it's genocidal, mm. it's suicidal, it's mm. whatever it is, uh, mm. it's terrible. Yeah. And from there, however, I move to the realist point of view. Mm. The realist point of view is, for example, we had Nuremberg. Mm which said law must apply equally to everyone, yes. that aggressive war is the supreme international crime, yes. that crimes against humanity deserve to be deterred by punishment. Yes. Uh, this was hailed by the whole world after 100 million people or mm. 200 million mm. people got killed. Nobody knows how many people die in wars. Yes. Nobody knows. Nobody I've, knows I've been participated in shoveling <laughs> them yeah. into a ditch and how yeah. many die of heartache yeah. and how many die of disease. Yes. Nobody knows. But we had, progress since those days, and uh, the progress, and, and these are part of the faults which still exist in the system. But we do have, we had Nuremberg, we have international courts, which people told me when I began work on this 70 years ago, uh, they said, it'll never happen, Ben, it'll never happen. And I said, you're probably right. Yeah. But it should happen, and it's right, and I'm going to work for it anyway. Yeah. And we've made enormous progress. I agree. Now let me give you one example of the enormous progress. Yes. You mentioned the Einsatzgruppen case. I was 27 years old. That was yes. my first case. I'd never been in a courtroom before. Yes. I was 27. I worked on trying to create a permanent international court in recognition when that court got its first international case in The Hague. They called me to do the closing remarks for the prosecution. I was 92. <laughs> 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 well, that told me several things. First of all, somebody had been listening, <laughs> and it's happened, and it's gone yes. forward. Second, it takes a long time. Yes. And it doesn't mean we've gotten perfect justice and a perfect yes. court. We haven't. We have all kinds of problems. Yes. But they're being overcome. And I see the progress. And when I see the progress, I get optimistic. No, I so think, I mean, this is, uh, you know, what you've just said, Ben, is so important. Uh, the, and you, you made me think of, uh, Isaiah Berlin's um, short credo, the speech he gave in 1994 in, at the University of Toronto, because he said what you were saying, 
he said, beware of the quiet philosopher who creates a philosophical ideal. And uh, to reach that utopia, you may have to clear the path of a few obstructions, including people who opposed the idea. Of course. And, and, and he said in, in the speech, um, uh, the search for a single overarching ideal, because it is the one and the only true one for humanity, invariably leads to coercion and then to destruction. Blood, eggs are broken, but the omelette is not in sight. There are only an infinite number of eggs, human lives, ready for the breaking. And in the end, the passionate idealists forget the omelette and just go on breaking eggs. So these are people who've sort of rationalized that there is something to be attained by violence. And what you're saying is violence <laughs> brings no good. And as humanity, we need to graduate to a point where war becomes unthinkable, not as a tool for achieving certain objectives, because ultimately in itself, it engenders so much criminal activity that it has to be uh, basically rendered unlawful completely. And as you said, aggression is the supreme uh, well international you've crime. You've gotten the point. He hasn't gotten the point. Um, mm. I'm not just breaking eggs. Mm. I'm trying to save the planet. Yes. Uh, I'm trying yes. to save the lives of all the people on this planet. Yes. And so our hope lies with the young people, the mm. young people who will recognize that what I say is true mm. and that their lives are in danger and increasing danger every day mm. as we perfect the cyberspace weapons. Mm. We still don't know what to do with mm. the nuclear waste mm. because that will kill everybody by itself. Yeah. And uh, as our capacity to kill increases and our concern for human rights and human needs is brushed into second place, they got the se sequence wrong. You'll yeah. never get to the second place yes. unless you reverse the first one, get rid of it yes. because that's what's causing the problem. Yeah. And uh, if we took the money we spend, uh, not only the United States, but other nations, on killing machines, killing weapons, and use it to meet fundamental human rights, mm. maternity rights, mm. uh, the right of a mother to, to mm. feed her children, the mm. uh, right of a person to go to school, mm. uh, the right of taking care of health, taking care of old people, mm. if, if we use that money for those purposes, mm. there wouldn't be the mm. kind of discontent which makes them determined to kill and die That's for right. their particular cause. That's right. But can I can I go, uh, Ben, to another uh, passion of yours? Uh, not just the search for justice, the end to all war, but to the protection and the justice done to victims in the form of restitution. Trying to you know create for them a semblance of some form of uh, reconstruction of their former lives. One of the things that has been troubling me a great deal is that when you have a, a judicial process uh, where alleged wrongdoings have been, have been uh, highlighted and charges have been pressed, is that in the context of the trials, when you see a defendant express no remorse, and you've uh, spoken about this, and I wish you'd uh, convey to the uh, audience uh, what it was like to sit with Otto Ollendorf, or, uh, Otto Ollendorf. When you see no remorse, uh, the, the victims themselves, for them, uh, the pain must be even deeper to see someone presented with all the evidence, unassailable, the argument is, uh, you, you concluded your, 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 your arguments in two days, and yet their refusal, the stubble, stubborn refusal to believe that they have done anything wrong, it, it must create deep pain for the victims. And, and I'll get to uh, another question I'll uh, ask in a few minutes. But if first of all, you can convey to us what it was like to talk to him for a few minutes, and then, um, what do you think we could do to have in place a system where people recognize their wrongdoing? If you're a victim of, of, the, most, of the most superficial sort of wrongdoing, you'd like to see the person say sorry, that they've done you wrong and they apologize for it. When the crimes are col colossal, you really want to see that. And when it isn't forthcoming, it hurts, I would imagine. Um, but if you could convey that... Uh, well, I could convey that very simply mm. by simply giving you a viewers my website. My yeah. <laughs> website is my name, benferenz.org. There you have it. Everything on it is free. 
You can plagiarize it, you can copy it, you can print it, you can burn it if you like. Um, and that answers, or tries to answer, <laughs> the questions which you pack together yeah. in such a compact pack that I don't know where to begin. So, so let me begin by giving you a quick overview and see if I can remember uh, some of the specific uh -huh. points. The quick overview is the outline of my life. I was born in poverty in Transylvania, which doesn't exist. My sister was born in the same bed. She's a Hungarian. I was born in the same bed. A year and a half later, I'm a Romanian by birth. We fled to the United States to escape poverty and persecution yes. in tr Transylvania, which no longer exists. Yes. Came to the United States. We were lucky. My father, who had been trained as a shoemaker, discovered that they don't wear boots in New York. And there are no cows in New York. And he was lucky to be given the, uh, the, the opportunity to live in a cellar if he became the janitor for the house. And he became the janitor in a dungeon in Hell's Kitchen. And that's where my life in America begins. Yes. Uh, the, where the walls were wet because we lived under the foundation of the house. From there, I jumped quick to, went to a special school. I was a gifted boy. I didn't know what a gifted boy was. <laughs> I never <laughs> ever gave me any gifts. <laughs> but I went to City College. I applied to the Harvard Law School. For some reason, they accepted me. The first exam on criminal law, I got a scholarship to the Harvard Law School, and I finished my education. The war was already on. I was trying to get into the military service. They wouldn't take me. I was too <laughs> short. I wasn't see right. In any case, eventually, I would get in as a private. I had finished my law school. I had passed my bar exam. I was assigned to the Army with all their intelligence. I had done the research for a book on war crimes. I knew all about war crimes. So they made me a private in the 115th AAA gun battalion, <laughs> which had 150 millimeter cannons built to shoot down airplanes. <laughs> we did shoot down airplanes. Most of them, unfortunately, were either British or American. But we did hit a couple of Germans, I guess. Um, so that's my educational background. Prepare me for life to be, OK? And it starts in the Army. And I see the horrors of war but I see them up close, very close. Not only, you know, people dying in combat. I landed on the beaches of Normandy. You find bodies floating in the water face down, wearing the American uniform, the tanks mired in the mud, trying to go through. I went through the Maginot Line, the Siegfried Line. I crossed the Rhine on a pontoon bridge, driving a jeep, final battle of the bulge. This was all part of my life. But then toward the end of the war, as we were already occupying German-held territory, my assignment, carrying out a promise made by Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin that there would be war crimes trials for the atrocities being committed, which were well known uh, in the United States and certainly in Germany as well. We'd promised and warned them there were going to be trials. They didn't know how to begin. They went to this Harvard professor. I had done the research for his book on war crimes. He said, find Benny. He's out there somewhere. <laughs> so they tapped me on the shoulder. I was then by that time promoted. They recognized my talent to a corporal. And uh, <laughs> the same as Hitler and the same as Napoleon. <laughs> and they transferred me out to the judge advocate section. And the colonel said to me, what's a war crime? I said, sit down, sir, and I'll explain it. So I was the first person in the United States Army to deal with war crimes in World War II. Yeah. And I was it. Yeah. I was the war crimes branch. Yeah. Pretty soon we began to get a few others, not many. And my job was to go out, first the Allied Flyers cases. Flyer who'd been shot down, he was almost invariably beaten to death uh, by the German mob on the ground. Sometimes he wasn't. He was led at a farmhouse. The soldier was away to the war, the widow or the wife was there, was glad to have help. He was treated relatively well. Most of the time, the mob got on him and beat him to death. Mm. I would go out, get the people together, tell the burgomaster or whatever official I could get. We had occupied the town. Mm. Bring in everybody who was near that area. I want to interrogate them and put them in a room. I didn't speak German then. I said, somebody speaks English German, you're the translator. Tell them. They're going to write out exactly what happened. No lies. Anybody who lies will be shot. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> and, and, and these days the human rights say, Ben, you didn't threaten to <laughs> shoot them, did you? He said, yeah, I threatened to shoot them. Yeah. Because what am I going to tell them? Yeah. Anybody who lies, I'll, be, I'll cry. Yeah. Or, or I'm going to, I'm naughty, naughty. Yeah. I mean, I had no other weapon. I yeah. had to tell them they're going to tell the truth. I only yeah. wanted to tell the truth. I didn't shoot anybody, yeah. in fact. Yeah. But I was 
intending to scare the hell out of them, yeah. and I did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they sat down and they wrote, and then I knew what happened. Yeah. Then I go try to catch the guy. Yeah. He had invariably fled, yeah. usually. Yeah. But I had the witnesses, and yeah. I had the evidence, and I had the bloody shirt, yeah. and, and so on. So I prepared the dossier. I found the bodies. Yeah. That was no fun. Yeah. Finding the bodies, locating them, they had been thrown into a river, or thrown into a ditch and covered over, digging them out in the cold winter, the hard ground, how to dig them out without coming out with just a foot and, and a limb mm. uh, is no fun. Uh, and I did that. And this was just the flyers. It wasn't other prisoners of war. It was essentially the down flyers. These were the down flyers. Yeah. These were the victims. Yeah. Uh, we have pictures of them in yeah. the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Yeah. Yeah. The Signal Corps came in yeah. and took pictures. I was so shocked when I saw them. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't look at them anymore because yeah. yeah. I recognized them. I had dug them up. You had dug them um, up, yeah. And mm -hmm. it was a very grim, yeah. very grim yeah. uh, indication of what war is like. Yeah. And uh, after that, we set up military tribunal trials in the Dachau concentration camp, about which very little is known, mm -hmm. and it's just as well, mm -hmm. uh, because they were quick trials. Mm -hmm. We'd take all the guards who had been mm -hmm. caught in Buchenwald, let's mm -hmm. say, and uh, Dachau. Mm -hmm. and put them in a room like a basketball court, mm. line them up, sit them on different places, put a number on them. Summary trial. Uh, yeah, a summary trial. Hey Schmidt, mm. you're accused of being a guard in mm. Dachau and mm. one of the other camps, but one while, uh, where inmates were being beaten regularly, were tortured and killed and murdered. What have you got to say for yourself? Oh, I was only obeying orders, or I wasn't even there, I was at my mm. grandmother's funeral, mm. uh, I hear it here for the first time, one mm. of them tried that on me, mm. uh, you know, mm. and uh, they then take them out, mm. three mm. officers, a captain and two mm. lieutenants, mm. come back in ten minutes, mm. all of the defendants are found guilty and sentenced mm. to death. Mm. And then they were taken mm. to Landsberg prison and yeah. shot. Yeah. This and nobody there were, there knows were quite about a few trials. of those trials, mm. the trials of the Allies. This were the, the trials the of the Allies. That's the French right. had some such That's trials right. as well. That's right. uh, but these are the Army military tribunals That's right. trials, That's right. which is not to do with anything with Nuremberg. That's right. Okay. But this is part of my experience now. So I have the first thing is to end the war, as yes, we were our, saying current, earlier. our current yeah. Secretary of Defense says, we've got to end the war, okay? Yes. The next step. What do you do then? You all, we caught the criminals yes. and try them. Yes. Put them on trial, prove what had happened. Right. The next step, which had all f always been forgotten, is what do you do for the victims? That's right. What happens then? And in the G German instance, all the Jews have been divested of their property. A Jew yeah. could not own property. It yeah. was illegal. It yeah. was taken over by somebody else. Yeah. Either a neighbor bought it or yeah. they seized it. So the next section was the restitution of unidentified and airless property, or if the former owner was alive, he would claim it, right. or his family could right. claim it. So the restitution program was part, which follows logically after education and stopping the war restitution. Is to help, yes. This was, then also, compensation for the victims themselves, not yeah. the property owners, but for damage to their health. People who were totally disabled, they never mm. could hold a job after mm. that. They would be shaking, trembling, or whatever. Mm. Uh, and they developed all kinds of diseases. So you have to set up a program to compensate them. How are you going to do that? Germany mm. is totally defeated. Mm. We bombed the hell out of them. Mm. They had no bread for their mm. inhabitants. The housing was gone. Mm. How do you do that? That was the biggest achievement of my life. Yeah. <laughs> I set up and those programs. Yeah. And uh, it was not easy. It required a great deal of imagination. But I operated on a very simple principle, which mm. I had learned in torts one in Harvard Law School. If you do an injury, a wrongful injury, you have an obligation to try to make good. Yes. Either repair the injury or compensate the injury. With that principle, I built on that principle, I set up restitution programs for the Nazi victims as well as legal aid societies to help them with their complicated claims to prove that they were really there and that they did suffer so and so, medical reports, etc. I set all that machinery up with the staff of about a thousand people. I did that acting as the agent of a consortium of the leading Jewish organizations of the world who asked me to take on the problem first of getting back the airless and unclaimed mm. property so we could use the proceeds for the benefit of the survivors. And that seemed to me a worthwhile thing. The Nuremberg trials were over. I didn't want to stay in Germany. 
I had four children born in Nuremberg. Mm. Uh, people said, how did you manage that? I said, well, the court was often in recess. Somehow, <laughs> <laughs> however, <laughs> I, <laughs> I stayed on and set up that program. Uh, I had a staff of over a thousand people working on that in every major office in countries, 19 different countries yeah. around the world where the victims had fled. Uh, and that was, you asked me what would be the major achievement of my life, that was it. When I left there, after doing it for about 10 years, uh, the Germans had paid out $50 billion yes. to the yes. various, partly to Israel, who took the people in, partly to the victims themselves, and they continue to this day. There is no Nazi victim, Jew and non-Jew equally. That was always the always principle. It was not on a religious grounds. Uh, there is no Nazi victim who is not a beneficiary of that program. They have no idea that I was in any way connected with that, and that sort of tickled me. Um, all right, let okay, me go so on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna press you on this point, uh, uh, Ben, because- uh, Well, the next point is how to prevent it from happening again, but well, let's I'll, go I'll, on. Okay, l let me, but I'm gonna sort of swing you uh, uh, back to the point that I, I raised beforehand, because it, you know, your incredible efforts to provide restitution. Yes. This form of thinking, when we put the International Criminal Court together, there was a very determined attempt uh, to not just seek retributive justice, but also to have a victim's trust fund and to make it clear that the victims, it's not just seeing justice done in terms of the perpetrator, but also as you have shown in the context of the suffering um, of those, I mean, the, the Jewish nationals uh, of Europe, but beyond, um, that, that there had to be something else. When I uh, recently, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, had the honor, because it was a, uh, an honor for me, to sit in Seoul, uh, the Republic of Korea, with uh, the victims of sexual slavery, the so-called comfort women. And we were talking about what would they need, what, would, what are their demands to ensure that somehow their suffering can be, can be recognized. Uh, one of them said to me, you have to believe me, it's, it's not the money. The money, I mean, we are elderly now, the money can go to other victims. We want to see a genuine recognition of remorse. And so I'm going to take you back to that because this idea that you're sitting with one of the chief architects, um, uh, the uh, uh, commander of Group D, Otto Ollendorf, and who is just blank faced and sitting. I mean, you presented all the evidence, it was uh, indisputable, and yet no sort of recognition. And I, I want to raise this because I think this is the part in everything that we're doing that is still missing. And I think there is an answer, but it may not be in the form of sort of the, the judicial systems that we have in place. The, the inkling comes from an interview that Gita Sereny did with Otto, sorry, with Franz uh, Stangl, the uh, second uh, commandant of Treblinka where in 1971 she was, he'd already been convicted by a West Ger German court and he was serving his sentence and he was never going to see the light of day again. I mean, he was, he was going to be in detention for the rest of his life. And she conducted a series of interviews, the last of which uh, she decided instead of asking him questions, she would let him talk. And she said to him, you know, what have you learned from all of this? And very slowly, he began to, began to recognize his guilt. But it, there were long pauses, half an hour between each answer. And then he sort of said, you know, I, I am guilty. And then he sort of uh, went on to say of having lived this long. In other words, he could got himself to the point, and he should have said of having murdered millions of people. But what gave away the sign that he eventually recognized uh, is the, his body sagged completely, and it's almost like he collapsed inside. In courtrooms uh, the world over, including in the International Criminal Court, seldom do we see this recognition, this contrition, um, which I would uh, argue the victims sort of need to see as well. Uh, do we need to think like that? And, and we know you have led the way in 
having us focus at all of these different components, but do we need to, because perhaps if we begin to see that, we begin to sort of make those who uh, are contemplating wrongful acts of recognizing before they were to conduct these, um, these or exercise uh, or perpetrate these actions, make them contemplate these issues in a deeper sense. Um, is there something in, in, in that way of thinking? Well, you've raised a, a very profound question, of human guilt and recognition of it. And of course, I faced, I dealt with that problem as well. When we got through with the complicated program, year-long program of compensating individual victims for provable injuries, well, as you would in an insurance case, um, that was prompted and made possible because a German chancellor, Conrad Adenauer, a devout Catholic, made a public speech in which he said terrible crimes have been committed in the name of the German people, and it imposes upon us a legal and moral obligation to try to make amends. Yeah. With that opening, yeah. we began to sit down and negotiate with the Germans. We said, how do we organize this? Now, yeah. what does he mean? How much? Who's going to pay? How is he going to settle it? And so we set up a small group. I was counsel to the group. I was a key player. I was yeah. not alone, but I was yes. captain of the team most of the yeah. time. <laughs> and uh, so we sat down in The Hague uh, because we wanted neutral territory. We were under careful guard by the secret police of the Germanys, of The Hague, of the United States. And uh, I don't know the United States, the Germans and the Dutch. Anyway, we were very carefully guarded because there was a terrorist group said, who's, who said, what are you doing? Mm. You're going to sit down with the murder of my parents and negotiate with them about money? Yeah. Have you no shame? Yeah. We'll kill you all. Yeah. And they set about to kill us all. Yeah. And that was their plan. And we had a guy on the inside, so we knew what was going on. Yeah. And that required tight security. They had some measure of success, about which I don't talk. Yeah. Um, but it was a very tense situation. And one of the leaders of this, what we would now call a terrorist gang, mm was a gentleman by the name of Menachem Begin, yeah. who became the Prime Minister of Israel yeah. and won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. You touch on the problem, what goes through the mind of the people, are they guilty? They won the Nobel Peace Prize for threatening mm. to kill me mm. because I was trying to get compensation, mm. some compensation for mm. the victims. Yeah. All right, that's another point. But let's go on to the problem itself of compensation. I have personally donated money to the Victims Fund. Yes. I was the largest single contributor yes. as of that time. Yes. I was very familiar with the negotiations for the fund. They had no idea what they were doing. Exactly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and I was one of those people who had no idea what they were doing. No idea. <laughs> That's complicated, enormously complicated. Yes. You know, if you if you come to a German doctor and you say, "Look, this guy has uh, survived the camp," and he gets up every night and he starts to cry, and he he does crazy things, prove to us his grandfather wasn't insane. Yes. You know, yes. and, and, and yes. things of yes. that kind. Yes. And then one wants to kill you for talking to him, the other one he says he didn't get enough. Right, you know? exactly. <laughs> so exactly. We're caught in between, exactly. and exactly. there's no money to pay with. And where do you get case. the money yes. for it? Yes. To invent the money. We invented the money yes. for it. Yes. Well, yes. I said I got $50 billion by the time I yes. left. That was quite a trick. Yes. My salary remained the same. <laughs> I couldn't feed my family on what I was earning. So the $50 billion was fictitious almost, <laughs> it was uh, at least initially. It was a real figure because yeah. we bought, we primed the German industry. Every every taxi in Israel yeah. is built by but then you But then you had the monies available then, or well, you we, we, potentially we, had We the money. got the goods and you had the money to <laughs> have the goods. We <laughs> set up a system of barter and trade mm. and priming the pump in Germany, and it worked out very well. Germans, we didn't dare publicize it because the Germans would object. They say, we're hungry and you're giving away money to these mm. people you told us we should kill. Mm. Uh, so it's very complicated, psychologically, physically, biologically, mm. financially. Mm. We overcame those problems, mm. and that was a Damn good trick, mm. Benny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't but like to talk about it because it sounds like you're boasting. But, but anyway, that was the next phase, compensating the victims. And it never had happened in human history. Yeah. No victims had directly been compensated. They had reparations, which they usually get, went to the government, and that didn't work very well either. But to have be unable to put through a claim, and I can say to you and sit here, that there is no Nazi victim who didn't have a right to claim, except those who lived in the Eastern Territories. If they were already in the Eastern they Territories, so they, they cut them out. They had a claim. Which I thought was outrageous too. I sneaked a couple of them in there, victims right. of 
Catholic w victims of medical experiments. I did that with the help of the Red Cross in Geneva. <laughs> Since you live in Geneva, That's right. they have all the records there. That's uh, and so I'm giving you the overall picture first to come to okay. your complicated question. About remorse. Of, of their remorse, remorse, see? Uh, and I will give you... Or lack of remorse, basically. Or absence of remorse. I would say the following. First of all, I lived in Germany to do all these things, a period almost 10 years. During that time, no German ever came up to me and said, I'm sorry, mm. none. Mm. And uh, as a small aside, when a few months ago, I met the ambassador uh, of Rwanda, a very nice lady. She was a speaker and I was yes. a speaker here too. She, I introduced myself. Uh, and I said, I want to apologize for what happened in Rwanda. Mm. And she was so impressed by that. I mean, I said, it's a shame. It's mm. a disgrace to humanity. Mm. 800,000 people mm. butchered after yeah. the Jewish genocide. Yeah. And he yeah. let it happen, yeah. knowing that it was, might happen. Yeah. And I said, that's a disgrace to our yeah. community. And yeah. I want to apologize. Yeah. So she began her remarks. She was impressed. But she said, I was very impressed by Ben Friends. I met him yeah. for the first time. The first thing he said, I want to apologize. Yeah. So now the German apology. No individual German said, I'm sorry, mm. okay? It would be asking too much mm. uh, because the people I'd ask, either their father was involved or mm. most likely themselves were involved. The German government decided I was going to, they were going to give me their highest civilian award for Dean's Kreuz Erste Klasse. Mm. Very fancy thing. It looked like mm. Rommel used to wear that. <laughs> uh, I said, I'll let you know. So I met with various groups, and I said, the German government wants to give me that medal. Uh, what's your reaction? I was not surprised to see that most of the people said, are you crazy? Mm. Uh, you're going to sit down? It was mm. the same group who wanted to kill us when we mm. negotiated. Mm. And you're going to let them hang a, mm. a ribbon around your neck? But the same people who murdered my parents? This was what year? This 1952. 1952. Uh, and uh, uh, 52, 53, and uh, maybe even 54 by the time of the medal, the because negotiations the, the began in 52. Because the West German the treaty trials began in 50, began. West German government only. Yeah. And East the West German, German trials began later in 65 and so forth. Well, so the, West German, the, yeah. the treaty on reparation was 1952. 1952, okay. And, and yes. uh, it was after that. Yeah. It was fairly yeah. recent, I mean, yeah. maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, I met with the groups. And uh, most of them said, are you crazy? You're yeah. not going to get a, let them yeah. whitewash themselves yeah. at our expense by giving you a medal, yeah. uh, using you as a patsy you know, yeah. for that. Yeah. And uh, I thought about it, and I said, I'm going to accept it. Yeah. And I'm going to accept it because this is another generation. Yeah. This is their way of saying, I'm sorry. Yeah. And it would be asking too much yeah. to ask the individuals who themselves were the murderers yeah. to say, I'm sorry, because yeah. they couldn't live with themselves. Yeah. They murdered children by smashing their heads against yeah. the tree. Yeah. It was common practice. Yeah. And I said, this is the new generation saying, yeah. I'm sorry, and yeah. I will not spit in their face by saying no. Yeah. And I accepted the prize. Uh, so A profound and elegant response. Hmm? A profound and elegant response by you. Okay. Then yeah. I met, I had already met with Ollendorf. I never talked to any of my defendants, uh, man to man, eye to eye. Yeah. I had captured their records. Mm. I had uh, daily reports from the front, top secret, mm. how many Jews they killed in which town, any mm. other people they killed, gypsies mm. as well, and other mm. opponents of the Reich, pres presumed opponents. Uh, and these I had totaled up to over a million people. Mm. At that point, I had been, my assignment had been, because I had a, that experience mm. during the war, to collect evidence of crimes. Mm. So General Telford Taylor, who was the mm. follow-up on Justice Jackson, the IMT, International mm. Military Tribunal trial, was already over. But he was got, got 12 additional trials mm. to give a cross-section of German life to see how it was possible yes. that a civilized country like that could commit these That's terrible right. crimes. That's right. So he said, Ben, look, when he hired me, uh, he said, before you hired me, he said, I've checked on your record in the military, yes. and I see that you are occasionally insubordinate. <laughs> I said, that's not correct, sir. I'm usually insubordinate. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, but I've been checking up on your record, too. And I don't think you're going to give me reason to be insubordinate. He said, you go with me. Anyway, he said, you go collect the evidence. Yes. And I had the evidence of 
these and, and he promoted you to an officer. You went from being corporal to uh, at that time an they, they wanted to get me. They offered me the rank of a full colonel. Full I said, colonel. in the That's army, great. I don't go. <laughs> and you didn't <laughs> have to go through West I Point the army. before. <laughs> they said, we'll give you a simulated rank. I said, okay. what's that? I said, can I again tell the lieutenant colonel yeah. where to go? She said, yeah. I said, OK. <laughs> and how, how long do I have to stay? You name it. I said, OK. <laughs> and I called my the lady to whom I've been happily wed for the last 73 years without a quarrel. I called her up and said, how would you like to go to Europe for a brief honeymoon? She said, I'd love it. She'd been waiting about 10 years. But you did. <laughs> I have to interject here because you did have a quarrel at some stage. And you perhaps uh, tell the viewer at, uh, later in the discussion uh, about your parachuting uh, uh, well, emergency. That, well, that wasn't and a quarrel. <laughs> well, the, but that you jumped ahead of your, your... I was at the door trying yeah. to open the door. Yes. And Telford Taylor was behind me, and yes. he was pushing the door. The wife was standing next to me. The first yes. thing I know, the door opens, and <laughs> I fall out. <laughs> but you left your wife behind in the I plane left that was I crashing. I felt very guilty about that. The door closed behind me. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to survive, and they're all going to be killed. <laughs> see, all right. okay. <laughs> it was not a quarrel. <laughs> no, okay. It wasn't a quarrel. Okay. <laughs> so but, let, me, let me take you back again. Okay. Go you, back. Go you back. You asked to so the many questions. You know, <laughs> I, you, I, okay. you got me there, le yeah. leading you through. The okay. So you're collecting part. evidence now. No. I collected the evidence of the trials, and I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't want to, except Otto Ohlendorf. He was the lead defendant. Yes. He, according to his testimony, the report said he had killed 90,000 Jews. I, he asked, I asked him, Would you, is that correct? He said, no. So what do you mean by that? Well, occasionally, the, the men used to brag about the body count. They were so proud of having killed more. They added more to it, uh, which I thought was very revealing as to the argument of superior orders. So for them, accuracy, he was felt that these numbers he, were inaccurate. He, they were, he, he knew the men had bragged about the body count. I said, would you say 70,000, 80,000? Yeah, that, that could be it. So the uh, so killing of innocent human beings wait for Wait a him minute. He was a very humane man. For example, he told me his humanity. When he said some of the men, they would just take an infant, smash his head against a tree. He said, I never let my men, men do that. I told him, when a woman's got an infant, and she's crying and the baby's crying, you aim at the, in, at the baby. You shoot through the baby and you kill both of them with one shot. You save ammunition and you solve the problem. And he said, I told my men, no more smashing against trees. You just shoot directly. It's an indication of humanitarian approach. <laughs> anyway, okay. So I got this guy, he's sentenced to death. Uh, he made a very interesting argument, very interesting because it's appropriate today. He said, look, Hitler knew more than I did. He had information in which he told us that the Russians planned to attack us. Therefore, it would be necessary for us to preempt that. An anticipatory self-defense is legally permissible. I have German Gutachten, expert opinion, saying it's permissible, and therefore, we acted in self-defense by beating him to the punch and attacking him. That's what we were doing. And I would do it again under similar circumstances. And he answered to the judge's question, if it was your daughter or your sister you had to send, would you kill her? Yes, he would. So he was a very patriotic German, right? Uh, intelligent, well-educated. I selected the 22 defendants on the basis of their education and their rank. I had about six or nine generals and others all had Rush had a double doctor degree. Yes. Uh, doctor, Doctor Rush. Yes. So I selected them on basis. These were top guys. I, I couldn't try three thousand people right. because they'd uh, be still sitting in Nuremberg right. uh, with a sampling. And uh, so Ollendorf gave me that argument. The next time I heard that argument was when the President of the United States, the current President addressed for the first time the United Nations General Assembly. Since we're sitting here in the United Nations, I watched the thing, and he explained that North Korea, he said, if they threaten us or our allies, including some little island somewhere, I will totally destroy them. And somebody had butted up the speech by saying, first, we're going to ask the United Nations to take it. You know, they should be responsible to that, really. You know? And uh, so he did put in that sort of talk, talk as well. But the threat was there. I will totally destroy them. And I'm watching this. And I said, Mr. President, and they didn't care what is Republican or, or Communist, or I don't care who, what are you talking about? Are you going to go in and kill all the people? 
like the Nazis tried to kill. They were aiming for 12, killing 12 million Jews. Uh, how do you destroy a nation? You pick it up and throw it in the ocean? What are you talking about? You're supposed to make them, uh, they're not afraid of us, and not to tr try to scare the hell out of them by talk like that. And I was shocked by the, uh, what I thought was the stupidity of that kind of a first address by the President of the United States. Mm. I cannot deny that. I'm, mm. I'm, I know that people are entitled to a difference of a point of view and that they should be respected. But to go threaten that you will totally destroy a country, are you gonna drop another nuclear bomb on them? You gonna hit them from Cyrus' face and wipe them out? What do you have in mind? Why do you threaten such a ridiculous thing, yeah. such a cruel and inhumane thing, you're President of the United States? Yeah. And that was my reaction to that. I didn't uh, say anything, but I wept inside. And uh, I, um, so now let me end, come mm -hmm. to the end of the story. The Germans had given me their highest award. Um, that was their expression of regret. I took it as that, uh, saying I'm sorry, because why pick on me? I mean, you know, I stuck the restitution program down their throat, yeah. and I hanged some yeah. of their favorite <laughs> customers. Yeah. Uh, and yet they did that. And I, and I accepted it, and I, I don't wear it, but no. <laughs> I have it in a drawer, <laughs> along with other medals. <laughs> it's a story ones. that uh, yeah. I hadn't heard before. Yeah. But you, you in, in speaking about the President's address to the General Assembly, uh, and in uh, the work that I do with my office, uh, Ben, when we, when we see the return of the thinking that somehow peoples are more exceptional than others, that, that they are uh, entitled to um, rights uh, that somehow differ from uh, the rights entitled or should that, sh that should be could be claimed by migrants, for instance, or those who are from ethnic and racial minorities or somehow different. And we see throughout uh, Europe, again, uh, sort of this almost relapse into a way of thinking which is, uh, to my mind and I'm sure to yours, um, deeply troubling uh, because in one way it sort of uh, shows the, the uh, lack or the absence of any deeper thinking about the history of the continent. Uh, so, and I've gone public on this, we have the Prime Minister of Hungary saying that he doesn't want his people to be uh, mixing with people of another color. Mm -hmm. uh, when there are barely 1,300 Afro-Hungarians in Hungary, a, a country of 10 million people, and he's just won his third uh, election. Um, we see uh, anti-Semitism rife again throughout Europe. Uh, we see hostility to, uh, of course, uh, immigrant communities again emerging from the far right. And even in uh, a country like Italy, uh, the birthplace of, of uh, fascism in terms of its philosophies, there's this group, uh, Casa Pound, which is, uh, which is openly fascist. And, and uh, they are being interviewed and they go around and uh, harass uh, immigrants. So, so once again, the fight is on. Maybe it never left us. Maybe this is a continuous struggle for those of us who believe in humanity uh, without distinction, without placing labels, without differentiating. We're all humans entitled to equal rights. and We, we deserve to live in dignity without deprivation, discrimination, or fear. Um, and uh, in that, um, as a, a, a proud American, someone who served his country in war and in peace, represented the United States in uh, the most arduous challenges, um, I noticed that uh, you put out a statement in the same way that we put out a statement uh, when uh, there was the separation of families taking place uh, in the United States. A country that uh, really, ever since the end of the Second World War, has been at the forefront in terms of the advocacy of universal rights and the universal rights agenda. It must have been painful for you to have seen this. It was very painful for me. Uh, I knew the Statue of Liberty. I came under the Statue of Liberty as an immigrant. Send me your homeless, your tired, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these. Uh, uh, the distress to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The lamp went out, 
when they said no immigrants allowed unless they meet the choir for the rules that we laid down. It was outrageous. I was, uh, I, I was furious at anybody would think that it's permissible to take the young children, four or five years of age, and take them away from the parents and say the parents go to another country, the children go to another country, we'll get you together maybe at some later date. It's a crime against humanity. The way we list crimes against humanity in the statute of the International Criminal Court, we have other inhumane acts designed to cause suffering, great suffering. What could cause more great suffering than what they did in the name of immigration law. It's ridiculous. You have to change the laws that's in the law. So I was furious, and we should be furious, and the students were furious. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a lot of encouragement, mm -hmm. because frankly, I may be sitting here in the United Nations, but I don't place my hopes on the diplomats mm -hmm. to make change. Mm -hmm. uh, they are dependent upon other countries, they are alliances, uh, they are their own jobs, and I don't depend upon the national politicians either, uh, because the countries are divided ever since time immemorial, some who glorify war making as the only answer for Molke mm -hmm. is the one I gave you and I can go to yes. the Peloponnesian Wars, it was yes. the same. It's existed for centuries, this glorification of what I'm now trying to turn around with your help, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, but we need more help and the students are with us. Mm -hmm. And I think the future lies with them, mm -hmm. uh, the young people. They are very busy now watching competition, ball games, and jumping and jumping. They call it music, okay, <laughs> whatever it is. Let them enjoy themselves. But some of them are thoughtful enough to recognize they're in great danger. Mm. And I warn them, and I talk to young students as much as I can. I have a network through the Harvard Divinity School and through the Buddhists and others trying to reach out to the young people, telling them, we now have the capacity to kill you all. Mm. And if you don't change the rules, and make it clear that the law has to be changed to meet the needs of the society it's supposed to serve. That's what law is all about. So it's illegal to do what they are doing. They are threatening you, they are wasting your assets and resources on killing machines when you needed to pay off your, your Mortgage, school tuition, school tuition uh, which should have been free for everybody. And I think the students would be responsive to that. Yes. Uh, but it requires a mechanism of re-education. And this is uh, an example of it. Your broadcast will be heard by many and people, I hope. <laughs> and we need you, Ben, to keep fighting for us as well. I never and give up. I know, <laughs> I know. I, I wish to recall how, when I was chairing those uh, negotiations on the crime of aggression and uh, a few years ago in Kampala, and it was at the end of a very long day uh, the discussion was tortured. There was very little agreement between the 193 delegates in the, in the hall. And as chair of the uh, working group, I was frustrated. And I reached uh, uh, 6 p.m., just about to end the discussion, and I needed inspiration, and I needed a pep talk. And I said, call Ben Ferent. <laughs> and you walked up to the podium. And you gave the delegates an inspired talk, but a dressing down as well. And you reminded us what is at stake, that this is not just battle over a few words here on a text, but we're talking about the future of humanity, the future of this planet. And uh, two or three days after that, we reached an agreement. You were very unhappy because you wanted more. And it's your presence that it's a constant reminder to us how we have to achieve and try to strive for something better. Ben Ferentz, thank you so much for this. Well, I, I thank you, you very much for the compliment of awareness. I don't, uh, I, uh, I'm glad to hear it. I don't pause to see if it's having an impact. I do the best I can and I never give up and I got a slogan, law, not war. And uh, I'd have that on my license plate in Florida and the front and the back of my car. And I never give up. And that's my advice to the students. Three pieces of advice I give them. One, never give up. Two, never give up. Three, never give up. That's correct. Ben, thank you so much. It's a true honor. Thank my you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.